Business. I am John Zandi. I'm one of the epileptologists at University Hospitals in Cleveland. I have no disclosures uh, to speak of, uh, so we will get underway. The things I'd like uh, to highlight in this talk, um, there are a few objectives. Uh, first of all, uh, would be epilepsy in the labor force. We'll talk a little bit about that. Then we'll talk about the perceptions of epilepsy and employment, kind of what people uh, may think in their heads when they think about these topics. And then we'll go over the facts, kind of the more concrete uh, features um, that are tied to these issues. And we'll end with uh, talking about what resources are available. So to start off, uh, just a few stats about epilepsy. Worldwide, uh, epilepsy affects everyone, all ethnic groups, rich and poor, young and old. Uh, this is a uh, non-discriminatory uh, uh, pathology. About 65 million people around the world have epilepsy, uh, which is about four to 10 out of every uh, 1,000 people at any given time. And uh, about 1% of Earth's population will have uh, a seizure at least one point in their lives. So this is uh, not, uh, not a niche um, malady. In the United States, about 3.4 million people uh, in the US have some form of epilepsy. Um, and that is out uh, of the 328 million our population currently stands at. That translates to 3 million adults, 470,000 children, and about one in 26 people in the United States uh, will develop epilepsy at some point in their lives. Um, as far as Ohio goes, uh, there are 126,000 active cases of epilepsy, 16, uh, roughly 17,000 of those are children. And we happen to rank seventh in the uh, state, uh, in the states um, as far as number of cases of epilepsy. So now a few statistics about the labor force. Um, in the United States, uh, we reached a high uh, of, uh, as far as our employment numbers, of 164.6 million in February of 2020. The unemployment rate uh, was near an all-time low at 3.5%. Uh, and then, of course, uh, unfortunately, everyone uh, knows what happened after that. COVID hit. Um, and as you can see, we have uh, this uh, decrease in the unemployment, uh, in, uh, in the unemployment rate uh, over the last decade. And then this big spike here uh, is unfortunately uh, due to uh, what happened with the coronavirus. Uh, as far as uh, labor and people with epilepsy, the numbers are uh, a bit concerning. So unemployment can be two to 5% higher than the general population and even seven, per, uh, seven times higher uh, if the onset of seizures uh, started in childhood. Uh, perhaps no surprise, uncontrolled epilepsy, um, patients were most likely to be unemployed. And on the, the flip side of that, well-controlled uh, epilepsy patients uh, were about equal uh, to the job numbers of the general population. Okay. So what are the financial costs of epilepsy? Uh, when we think about uh, the direct yearly uh, healthcare costs for any person, it's anywhere from 10 to 47,000. Uh, epilepsy specific, we're talking numbers about 1,000 uh, to 20,000. So the above number uh, people who have seizures that are well controlled um, and the epilepsy may not factor into those uh, that price of their overall health. But when we look at uh, epilepsy specifically, um, it is uh, quite an additional uh, cost. Uh, those numbers unfortunately uh, climb higher uh, when the seizures are uncontrolled, refractory, or there are comorbid issues associated with that. Um, we also know uh, from the studies that have been done in the past <clears throat> that uh, for uh, people who suffer with epilepsy, uh, the mean annual income has averaged about 25% less than the general population. That, uh, that has changed a little bit, um, but it does uh, continue to reflect uh, the problems of unemployment and underemployment uh, in the epilepsy population. And when we talk about children uh, who suffer seizures, they are more likely uh, statistically to live in poverty and uh, their parents are more frequent to report uh, food insecurity. Um, so outside of the monetary costs, there are certainly um, uh, lifestyle costs as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about those now. 
Um, the comorbid conditions that can come with epilepsy, uh, the side effects from anti-epileptic medications, unfortunately there's, there's no perfect drug out there, and even if the seizures are controlled, uh, the risks of side effects are present. And then we know there's a fairly high comorbidity with epilepsy and depression, uh, and depression does bring about uh, its own uh, quality of life and costs uh, associated with it. Epilepsy, we know, can also impair life goals. Uh, they may uh, impair educational uh, goals, the ability to drive, uh, developing and maintaining uh, social relationships, um, and the uh, employment trajectory. So uh, if a person with epilepsy does uh, have a job, um, there have been concerns in past studies about uh, their trajectory and achieving uh, kind of that climb of the corporate ladder uh, into managerial positions. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so as far as the complexities uh, go, uh, they are multiple, uh, and these factors are fairly complex. It's not just necessarily uh, the fact that people uh, have epilepsy and suffer from seizures, um, but there are multiple uh, different things to keep in mind. Among those are the personal attitudes and uh, self-image of uh, both external uh, people when they consider epilepsy and the epilepsy patients themselves um, may feel to varying degrees uh, that their epilepsy uh, poses a challenge uh, to their lives. And then uh, the attitudes of those potential coworkers and what they understand about epilepsy, what their expectations are uh, in working with someone with epilepsy. Uh, and then as well as the statutory regulations and the limitations uh, that uh, the law places on uh, uh, people who suffer epilepsy. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, and then finally, seizure control and, and uh, achievements um, coming in. Certainly, as we uh, hinted before, the better controlled seizures are. Um, the uh, less it affects our daily lives and may uh, set us up for uh, the achievements that we want to pursue. Um, but if seizures are not controlled, uh, it makes kind of achieving those things uh, much more difficult. Uh, and Craig and Oxley in a study, uh, it's an older study in 98, uh, but uh, did kind of cover this uh, with a nice uh, graphic. Uh, the covert uh, issues are those that may not quite be clear uh, to the public eye, but those coming from the outside, uh, like those of the employers and coworkers. Uh, the intrinsic uh, fears that, that we face, um, uh, the impaired self-image, uh, potential low expectations, uh, and epilepsy uh, patients there, uh, have their own uh, beliefs about uh, work, and what they, they can and cannot do. Uh, and those are uh, something we'll talk about a bit later um, because they're not always necessarily uh, accurate. Um, and then certainly the statutory limitations uh, being the uh, more clear uh, extrinsic factors that come into it and uh, the comorbidities of, uh, of epilepsy uh, coming in with potential uh, cognitive impairments and uh, uh, school limitations. So just to take a second aside, uh, why work? Why is this such a big deal? Um, uh, that question sounds silly, uh, but many have asked it over the years. Uh, so I do just want to take uh, a second to, uh, uh, to talk about it. So when we think about what fulfills us, um, there was a study done uh, a couple of years back um, that was reflected in the, uh, <coughs> the Harvard Business Review Journal. And the top three things uh, that make for fulfilling lives they found in their survey uh, was a good family, possessing a good self-confidence, and finally having a worthwhile job. So having a job, something uh, to go to, that structure in life, um, that is something that uh, the surveyors found uh, to be something that we find fulfills us, that makes our lives worthwhile and, and keeps us um, in a good emotional state. Um, employment status in, in some broader studies have also correlated uh, with mental well-being scores and quality of life. So, uh, emotional well-being and energy and fatigue scores uh, were, were better uh, in those who were employed, and this is all comers, uh, uh, not just the epilepsy population, but the general population. 
And then those that, uh, that were unemployed uh, reported about 30% more negative emotional experiences in their lives. Um, and that can be for various reasons, um, but was something uh, that was shown. Uh, so a quote from that study, around the world, uh, the employed evaluate the quality of their lives much more highly on average as compared to the unemployed. And that is something uh, that does uh, become important when uh, we think about what we want from our lives and want to take from our lives. And those are not uh, monetary aspects of well. So the quality of life, um, the things that drive our well-being, exert a strong influence on our happiness, uh, are tied not just from uh, the uh, financial things that we derive from employment, uh, but also uh, kind of the, the more subjective factors as well. Uh, those being social status, uh, social relationships, having that daily structure that we talked about, and the directed goals. Um, uh, by and large, I, I think my patients uh, have been eager uh, to work or get back to work. Um, and that is something I do encourage uh, because uh, we, I do believe that uh, that does help uh, people's happiness and, and well-being. Um, so when we think about uh, the uh, concerns of people uh, with epilepsy, what are they concerned about? Um, well, they are concerned about employment and within that, uh, a couple of different factors. So both the process of applying for work, uh, whether or not to disclose to their potential employer or uh, the uh, interviewer that they're uh, applying with, uh, whether or not to disclose their epilepsy. Uh, once they get the job, maintaining that employment and avoiding any, any kind of uh, factors that might uh, lead to dismissal. Uh, and then of course, achieving success in the workplace, um, making the most out of uh, that time at the job and setting them up for success. Uh, independent of their epilepsy. So what does that, uh, what does that look like? First, we'll take a look at the perceptions. So what, what are kind of the things that uh, people have subjectively reported uh, when they think about epilepsy in the workplace? Uh, and we'll look at it from kind of two ends of the coin. Uh, the first end, um, when we think about general perceptions, uh, we do think about the social stigma of epilepsy. Uh, epilepsy, as we know, uh, throughout the millennia uh, has been looked at in various different ways, going back thousands of years. Uh, it was tied to, inappropriately, I might add, but tied to uh, demonic possession. And it wasn't really until uh, kind of coming more into the modern era that we finally uh, were able to better understand the workings of the brain and shed that awful stigma uh, that was in place and understand this uh, for a uh, malady of the brain. Uh, that's something we uh, both should understand and work towards, uh, towards helping. Um, epilepsy can be related to uh, poor psychosocial outcomes, as we kind of talked about before, a loss of status and, and power, separation, uh, a feeling of separation from the general culture um, because of the way that seizures affect our lives, and then uh, can tend to override our other uh, personality traits. So we might be a very intrinsically uh, happy person uh, with a lot of zest for life, but certainly if we're suffering seizures, um, that can take its toll. Um, and those are certainly the things that, that we want to address. Um, and then when we think about uh, individual attitude versus group attitudes of, uh, of epilepsy, it is important to consider one voice may sound very different uh, than a group mentality. So. Uh, you know, back thinking about when uh, these uh, social stigmas were a bit worse, uh, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone feels that way. And that's a very important uh, thing to think about, especially because a feeling of stigma is not necessarily equal to prejudice. Um, so prejudice being that uh, uh, the way that that uh, stigma plays out, um, one might feel stigmatized or look at epilepsy as something that uh, does create this stigma. Um, but that does not necessarily translate uh, into uh, limitations that are imposed from those extrinsic uh, forces that we talked about. So I mentioned we're going to look at this from two sides of the coin. The first side of the coin is the employer, um, those who are looking to hire people and uh, what they face about epilepsy. So in past studies, there has been concern uh, about dangers uh, that the employers have voiced, um, particularly with jobs that may place a patient at risk. Um, and uh, there has been, and these are 
uh, older studies kind of going back uh, 10, 20 years, I'm happy to say things have gotten better. Uh, but employers felt that they were under pressure to hire uh, people who are 100% fit or able, uh, who may not uh, uh, have uh, limitations that, that would need to be taken into account. Um, and that uh, in the workplace nowadays, there is more competition in general. A lot of people are, are trying to get jobs. Um, and so um, they, we want to make sure that all our applicants, uh, whether they have FLOC or not, are uh, prepared for that success. And then, of course, the, the personal views of epilepsy uh, influencing the challenges of getting a job. And from more recent studies, uh, employers polled uh, felt that epilepsy uh, was something that could uh, potentially affect uh, uh, the job uh, force, um, but that company uh, doctors could make fair assessments as to the capabilities of, uh, of those uh, applicants um, to carry out their duties, and they generally would trust uh, that if the doctor is, is uh, saying that uh, this looks well controlled, everything looks okay, the employees uh, would kind of cop to that attitude. Um, and then there's been various uh, 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 attempts at awareness training uh, programs uh, to kind of get the workforce of a business uh, more aware of the disease of epilepsy uh, and uh, kind of increase that understanding. Um, However, uh, in practice, there has been kind of limited benefit uh, given people's own kind of strength of their views. So uh, if one of the workers um, already felt uh, positive about epilepsy and, and seizures and that uh, it was something that uh, you know, can certainly be worked with, then it, it, the awareness training didn't necessarily affect their views. And if there were, uh, conversely, uh, coworkers who uh, kind of had these negative uh, uh, experiences with epilepsy kind of based on their own personal lives um, the awareness training hasn't always been shown to help. Now that didn't really change much if whether or not the training was compulsory if they had to do it, um, if it was a voluntary awareness training session, or uh, if there was no uh, awareness training at all. It seemed to stay pretty consistent. So looking deeper into uh, employer attitudes um, there was, uh, in the studies, an overall lack of employer knowledges, uh, knowledge about uh, the disease of epilepsy, uh, what the, the uh, uh, applicants faced, and uh, what it could mean uh, for the effect on their jobs. Now, because of this variability of uh, personal understanding, it was found to be pretty highly dependent on one's own personal experience. So if the boss knew somebody with epilepsy, uh, and uh, felt either positively or uh, had reservations about their own experiences, uh, those did unfortunately tend to carry over uh, into their thinking. And there is uh, still uh, a fairly uh, poor understanding of how common epilepsy is. So we talked at the beginning um, that 1% of the world's population uh, is probably going to have uh, a seizure at one point in their life. And when we look at America, uh, one in 26 people, that's uh, nearly uh, just under four uh, 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 people um, uh, per 100 who would, who would face this. Um, so it is a very common uh, illness, and employers still don't necessarily understand just how common it is. Um, one of the reasons for that is possibly because epilepsy can be considered a hidden condition. If, if one suffers from seizures, but they're very well controlled, or they only happen at night when they're outside of the workplace. Um, it may have uh, no effect on their job, no effect on their life, uh, and uh, nothing that uh, the bosses would even would even think about, um, and that may limit their understanding a bit further. Um, then there is the other problem of uh, having equal opportunities for patients with epilepsy or or other uh, maladies or or uh, kind of personal. Um, statistics, and there is uh, competition out there. So obviously we want uh, every uh, uh, person in the workforce uh, to avoid any kind of discrimination. Um, and there's been a lot of press uh, and uh, attention uh, put to uh, ensuring that there's no racial or sexual discrimination, um, but that can divert attention and resources uh, away from kind of making sure that, uh, ensuring that there are policies in place uh, that are a little more specific uh, to epilepsy. Um, 
And then uh, just kind of looking from 20,000 feet, the employers are not unlike the general population. So the general population tends to be uh, not necessarily fully aware of the extent of what epilepsy patients uh, suffer uh, and their problems with employment. And that uh, epilepsy is generally not considered a disability unless the seizures are uncontrolled. So again, uh, if seizures are pretty well controlled, um, it may not be out in the public eye as much. And so uh, to the lay public, the people who are not familiar with epilepsy, uh, they may not see it uh, as, as uh, something that affects life as much as it can. Um, and one of the reasons for this, again, is uh, the disability is not immediately obvious. So this is, this is not necessarily a, a disease that we see people wear on their sleeves, um, but something uh, they can offer, uh, uh, often suffer uh, in, in private. Uh, and that is something that, that we want to, uh, to avoid. We want to make sure that people are aware of this, um, that they're uh, getting help and treatment for this, and that they're maximizing uh, their possibilities and potential. Um, because these patients uh, do uh, certainly, certainly deserve uh, for those things uh, to come true. Um, there are concerns uh, for em uh, employers in possible rises of absenteeism, uh, workplace accidents, and general employee uh, safety concerns. Again, those are things that employers voice, uh, but there really is no evidence to support this at all. Um, and that's kind of the, one of the things that we continue to fight is that uh, these misconceptions uh, can affect the way that, that some employers approach uh, the concept of, of epilepsy, but there's really no evidence to, to back that up. Uh, but because of that, unfortunately, uh, in the past and even now still, uh, there can be some unnecessary restrictions. This used to be much worse than it is now. Um, people having unwarranted change of duties uh, they might be completely capable uh, of, of doing whatever task uh, they were hired to do, but because of uh, the unfounded, uh, inappropriate concerns of their employer, they may be tasked uh, to different duties. And in the, in the past, uh, going back a couple of decades, uh, it, tragically, uh, there had been a practice to medically retire uh, epileptic em employees, certainly something that is uh, very inappropriate. Uh, and I'm happy to say it has been, been changing in the decades since. So the other side of that coin is the employees themselves, um, particularly the, the patients with epilepsy who are uh, looking to, uh, to get a job, maintain their job, uh, and uh, how that interacts with the social acceptance uh, in their workplace. So again, it is highly dependent on people's knowledge of epilepsy based on their personal experience, um, there are a lot of broad and diverse understandings. Again, people may be very familiar with epilepsy and others uh, may not have know what a seizure is. Um, and because of that, there have been in, uh, misconceptions. Uh, the nature of the unpredictability of seizures, uh, the need uh, and degree of first aid uh, that some coworkers may feel like they need to be ready at any time to, to administer, not uh, necessarily correct. Um, and so because of those uh, misconceptions, that is uh, a hurdle uh, that has been voiced uh, in the studies of people with epilepsy and employing for job, uh, applying for jobs, uh, and uh, uh, both when they have the job as well. There also does tend to be an internalization of these community attitudes. Um, we mentioned the stigmas and negative attitudes uh, that have uh, occurred in the past. Luckily, those are getting better. Um, and generally, uh, in more recent surveys and more recent studies, uh, the public generally has a positive attitude uh, towards their colleagues uh, who have epilepsy and those with epilepsy uh, having more positive attitudes themselves. Um, now with that, uh, there is uh, some uh, degree of reporting of an expectation of rejection. If the employee, the potential employee with epilepsy, uh, might be hesitant to disclose the fact that they have epilepsy to employers, and we'll talk a bit more about that um, as we go on. So employee uh, attitudes are largely dependent on control. Uh, no real surprise there. If, uh, if the patients have seizure freedom, uh, they're in remission, uh, as we talked about earlier, they tend to report a better quality of life. Um, the things that do impact their quality of life uh, are particularly uh, with a degree of their seizure control and the unpredictability of uh, potentially having seizures. Uh, 
Um, again, uh, there is uh, the impairments uh, that patients face uh, to the external perceptions and their internal perceptions of what their, uh, their epilepsy may uh, uh, encompass and the challenges uh, that they face. Uh, comorbid uh, issues with their general health, uh, their mental health, their roles in society, all are things that <clears throat> patients with epilepsy have voiced as things that uh, they're concerned about, particularly in the setting of uh, what their work uh, life might look like. And these are impacted by, again, uh, their kind of underlying personality, uh, their social support systems, uh, and their uh, intellectual abilities. And some of the things that uh, people with epilepsy have voiced as concerns when looking at getting a job uh, include uh, a misperception that, that you have to work to be normal. Uh, that's not necessarily true. Um, again, uh, I mentioned the studies earlier that uh, there can be a more positive uh, emotional attitude uh, with, with gainful employment, but uh, certainly not uh, the fact that you have to work to be normal. Um, or having enough uh, education to work, uh, that is, is also uh, not true. Um, Fears of work injuries, both from uh, those people who support you, the family, and, and those uh, views that are held uh, themselves. Um, and then the false perception uh, or incomplete uh, 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 view that uh, they might uh, injure a coworker or get injured themselves uh, if they're at work. Uh, and then certainly the way that seizures uh, would affect their performance uh, and again, the underlying views of, of uh, their support system. So all of that was a bit of uh, perception. And again, perception is not always reality. Um, <clears throat> certainly there can be kernels of, of truth uh, laid within about how it affects life and uh, the day-to-day -day possibilities. Um, but I wanna kind of switch uh, and talk more about the facts now. Uh, what does epilepsy and employment look like? and uh, how has that uh, changed over time. So uh, to think about seizure types and employment status, uh, believe it or not, uh, there is uh, some dependence on what types of seizures you have as far as statistics go. Um, as you can imagine, people with more frequent seizures uh, tend to have a higher rate of unemployment as a group. And particularly those with uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures are less likely to be employed. Um, however, uh, those that suffer uh, tonic-clonic seizures, as long as they're in remission, tend to correlate uh, employment uh, status uh, with just the general population, and it's like, uh, less likely something to be uh, uh, associated with their, their seizure. Um, and then, as we kind of teased at the beginning of the talk, uh, the younger age of seizure onset does tend to be uh, associated with a higher uh, rate of unemployment. Um, there are various uh, reasons for that, most, uh, uh, most prominently being um, the more long-term sufferers of the disease may have had a difficult time getting their footing in the workplace uh, to begin with, and then that is something that has unfortunately uh, kind of propagated uh, as their lives have gone on. Now, of course, there are other, uh, are other factors, as we mentioned before, medication side effects and the psychosocial issues that come with epilepsy at times. Uh, those... Uh, involving self-esteem, uh, coping mechanisms, et cetera. So enter the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA. It was developed in the 90s, and they kind of revisited it in the uh, mid to late 2000s. It is a federal law prohibiting discrimination against qualified individuals with disabilities, period. So any uh, qualified individual with any disability, there is federal law prohibiting that discrimination. Now it does uh, apply to the federal, state, and the local levels. Um, with the ADA itself, uh, it does uh, cover both uh, public and private employers uh, with 15 employers or more. So you might think that those with uh, fewer than 15 employees uh, may not need to uh, may not be under the mandates of the ADA. But luckily, uh, more local governments uh, in the states uh, have their own laws prohibiting any employment uh, discrimination, uh, no matter how many employers you have. And, and that is um, obviously something that uh, is, is important. 
Um, and these things are enforced by the U.S. Equal uh, Opportunity Employee uh, uh, Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC. So what do they do? Uh, well, they, um, they enforce uh, the mandates of the ADA. And on their website, there's actually a whole section to, uh, devoted to epilepsy. Again, uh, this is a, a blanket policy against any kind of disability. Um, but I was pleased to see that they do give uh, epilepsy uh, its own uh, web page uh, and kind of break down the stipulations uh, with there. Uh, so I do encourage uh, you to check out uh, their website um, as it does uh, provide further information. Um, as far as what they consider epilepsy to be, it's pretty much in line uh, with what epilepsy is, and that's a chronic neurological condition characterized by recurrent seizures. So again, they enforce the provisions of the ADA um, and uh, those particularly that apply to uh, patients with epilepsy. So what does that look like? Um, they discuss uh, that when an employer may ask an applicant or employee questions about his or her epilepsy and how it should uh, treat voluntary disclosures, they offer information on that. Um, they also kind of help to determine the reasonable types of accommodations uh, that might be needed uh, by employees with epilepsy, and how the employers should handle safety concerns about applicants and employees with epilepsy, uh, as well as how employers can ensure uh, that no employee is harassed because of their epilepsy uh, or any other disability. Again, this is uh, the mandates of the ADA apply to all disabilities. Um, and so uh, whether or not you have epilepsy uh, or, or something else, um, there are mandates on, on how to do that. So let's shift focus a little bit and do a little bit of role playing. Um, if you're looking to get a job, what is the process uh, and uh, what might you face? So uh, if your boss asks you, do you have epilepsy? They are not allowed to do that. That is a question that is uh, off limits by the mandates of the ADA and enforced again by the uh, Equal, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. That is not a question that is allowed in a job interview. Uh, employers are not allowed to ask um, questions about an applicant's medical conditions, including their epilepsy. So really any other uh, medical condition uh, is, is uh, strictly an illegal question. Uh, off limits specifically with epilepsy are whether or not you have epilepsy or seizures. They cannot ask that. They cannot ask you whether you are on prescription medications, whether you've ever filed for workers' compensation, or whether you have been injured on the job. Uh, those things are not allowed. Um, and then uh, further, uh, what the employee can ask uh, would really just uh, pertain to an applicant's qualifications. So when looking at the job, again, the employer cannot ask any questions about epilepsy or seizures. Um, they are allowed to ask questions that might be pertinent to the job, like uh, do you have a driver's license if you're uh, applying for a job that you might need to drive to or drive in, uh, or uh, whether or not you are able to operate heavy machinery. Um, certainly taking a factory job, that would be an important question. They are allowed uh, to ask that, uh, but in the response, uh, the applicant uh, only needs to say yes or no. Uh, they don't need to say why. So then we talk about disclosures. Uh, patient, uh, people with epilepsy, uh, when applying for a job, have no duty to disclose, none whatsoever. Uh, the ADA doesn't require applicants to disclose epilepsy. The only exception to this is if they need to disclose uh, if he or she will need a reasonable accommodation. Uh, for instance, uh, time to step away and take uh, needed uh, medication. In that sense, um, uh, generally uh, people applying for jobs uh, with epilepsy would need to, to say that up front, uh, that they would need uh, time to take away, uh, to step away uh, and take medications. Again, it doesn't have to uh, be known uh, what the, the medication is for. Um, whether it's uh, hypertension or epilepsy or anything like that, uh, but just that you will need time. Uh, and then a note about employer sentiments. So in the past studies that have been done by employers, they have voiced that if their applicants did not disclose or were hesitant to disclose, uh, 
could be considered a breach of trust towards that applicant. Um, but as, as the years have gone on and the understanding of the ADA uh, has come more a bit into focus, uh, that has improved. So what if you say uh, outright, I have epilepsy, whether uh, uh, when applying for the job or as we'll talk about uh, afterwards, uh, that would be a voluntary disclosure, something that you are voluntarily doing, even though you don't have to. And let's say you do it during the interview. Even if you tell them, I have epilepsy, the employer cannot ask follow-up questions. They cannot ask about the nature of your epilepsy, the treatment of your epilepsy, what that looks like, if your epilepsy is going to get better or worse, the prognosis. Those questions are off the table, uh, and they are not allowed to ask them. It's illegal to do so. The employer can ask, again, whether the applicant will need an accommodation. Uh, so let's say you say, I have epilepsy. The employer's answer to that would be, uh, is there anything, uh, any kind of accommodation that you would need uh, in looking at your job? Whether that be time uh, or maybe a slight adjustment of the position, um, those things are, uh, are some uh, questions the employee can ask. But even with that, the employer must keep the information confidential. Uh, so they cannot share that with other employees. Uh, it is completely up to you, the applicant, uh, to uh, disclose uh, to other people uh, or not. So congratulations, you got the job. Um, even after getting the job, the employer can ask you again uh, whether you need uh, an accommodation and what type uh, that would be. They must keep it confidential. So let's say you decide not to disclose that you have epilepsy when you're applying for the job, but after you get hired. So let's say you go through the interview, normal interview, uh, you do not bring up uh, the fact that you have epilepsy or seizures, um, and you get the job, and then you decide to tell the boss. Well, that is okay. Um, and in that instance, the employer cannot rescind uh, the job offer. They can't take it back. Um, that would be, uh, uh, illegal uh, in just about every situation. Uh, the same rules uh, further apply regarding questions. Uh, if you tell them after the job, uh, after they give you the job that you have epilepsy, they can't ask more about uh, how your seizures are controlled, what medications you're on, what the prognosis is. They cannot ask any of those questions. Again, the only things that they can ask are whether or not uh, you might need a reasonable accommodation. The one exception to this would be if you've lied about your capabilities. Um, if you've said uh, something that you know you cannot do, um, they would have uh, uh, cause to maybe rescind your job offer. But that's essentially true with any uh, job application. If uh, you're applying uh, to be a uh, uh, marine biologist, uh, for example, and you've never seen a fish or been in the ocean, uh, but say that, that you're completely qualified to do that, that would be cause uh, to rescind the job offer, but that's in any field. Um, so nothing uh, unique to have what in that regard. So we've talked a lot about reasonable accommodations. What are those? What do they look like? Um, we've hinted a little bit. Uh, there are any change or adjustment uh, to the job, the work environment, or the manner in which the job is done. It enables one to apply uh, and perform and fully enjoy equal access to a job. So let's say a job is out there um, and a reasonable accommodation is needed uh, for you to uh, be successful in the job and for you to uh, be able to not only fulfill that position for your employer, but also make the most of it for yourself. Um, any of those things uh, would fall under a category as a reasonable uh, uh, adjust uh, accommodation. Um, it ensures that equal opportunity to fully participate in, employee, in employment uh, as your colleagues would have. Uh, some examples uh, would be time to take, uh, set aside to take medications. Uh, if you did have a breakthrough seizure during the job, you might need a, a few more uh, hours of break time uh, to recover if it was uh, uh, you know, a small one. Uh, if it was a bigger seizure, you might need several days off of work. Um, and those are reasonable things. Uh, that uh, would be in place to accommodate you. Uh, the additional break time to mitigate fatigue as well. Uh, let's say you're on, on an anti-epileptic medication, your seizures are controlled, uh, but you know after you take uh, your pepper in the morning, uh, you get a little tired uh, and you might need an extended break uh, to finish that cup of coffee. Uh, 
um, that would be something reasonable as well. And then certainly consistent shift work to reduce sleep cycle disruptions, uh, ensure you get adequate sleep. As we know, uh, sleep deprivation does uh, lower the seizure threshold. Um, and so certainly making sure that um, you are set up for success uh, to have consistent uh, sleep work would be important. And then issues of safety, making sure there are shielding around dangerous machinery or equipment. Uh, if there's padding and carpeting, uh, you know, when possible, rather than uh, a concrete floor, um, those would be things that, that would further be uh, reasonable accommodations. But there are also things that are mostly good ideas anyway. Obviously, if you had a, a terribly dangerous uh, 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 saw or something like that uh, that you might be working around, even if your epilepsy is well controlled, it would pretty much be reasonable to have some kind of protection around that. Uh, but that would be true for anyone working in a dangerous situation like that. So again, if you don't disclose, uh, what is your uh, employer able to do and not able to do? Well, um, let's say you don't tell them at all. Uh, let's say you have epilepsy, you don't uh, tell them at the interview, you don't tell them after you got the job, kind of just go about your daily life, and then you have a breakthrough seizure. In that situation, um, the employee is permitted to inquire about epilepsy uh, if you have a seizure on duty, but only in cer uh, certain circumstances. So they can ask you about your seizures if the safety of an employee or their colleagues might be at stake, or if, uh, if it affects the, the job performance. Uh, in that regard, they might require a leave of absence or reassignment if it comes out that uh, you're in a position that might uh, pose danger to yourself or your colleagues, um, or that it's affecting your job assistance. Um, they might be able to uh, request that, uh, that you take a leave of absence to kind of get the seizures better under control, or reassign you to a different um, uh, position uh, that would not uh, pose those risks. Um, again, particularly if seizures pose a threat to the safety of others or affect the job, that is the only time that the employer is permitted to ask you about the nature of your epilepsy. So uh, we talked a little bit about hazards of the job. Um, general things uh, to consider uh, when keeping this in mind. Jobs, any job that involves working near a body of water, climbing high heights, uh, working with heavy machinery, hazardous chemicals, or a job that fully depends on driving frequency. So again, those are job ha hazards uh, that need to be really weighed uh, in, in people with epilepsy when looking at their job. Uh, certainly, if they were working on uh, the top of large cell phone towers, let's say their seizures were well controlled, they've been fully uh, free of seizures for a long time, there is still a risk of a breakthrough seizure uh, we know, even if your seizures have been well controlled, uh, and one single breakthrough seizure in a job like that um, could uh, have uh, very dangerous and even fatal consequences. So those are uh, hazards uh, that you would want to really kind of think about uh, when you're uh, applying for a job. And then there are some jobs, uh, though few, that are uh, flat out restricted or banned. And we'll talk uh, just a little bit about those. Um, restricted uh, positions. Under federal law, an employer can, uh, generally cannot refuse to hire or fire an individual with a disability who is qualified to perform the uh, functions of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation because of his disability. Again, that's uh, straight from the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, if you're qualified for the job, you can't be discriminated against. Um, you have to be uh, equally considered as anyone else. The exceptions to that uh, would include if getting the job would pose a direct threat to the health or safety of uh, him or herself or others, and the risk cannot be eliminated by using a reasonable accommodation. So again, <clears throat> if it is something uh, where uh, uh, an accommodation can help eliminate that, that, uh, that threat, then it would be okay. Um, but if there is not a type of reasonable accommodation uh, to, to rescue it, um, those would be exceptions. The other one uh, is if imposing uh, that reasonable uh, accommodation, if kind of putting that accommodation that would be necessary in place would impose an undue burden on the employer in terms of expense or administration, um, 
that would also be an exception. So for instance, uh, if you had uh, breakthrough seizures and uh, uh, needed a day or two off, that would be a reasonable accommodation. Uh, but if you're gonna be off uh, for months or even years at a time, uh, that would be a bit of an, uh, of an undue burden uh, in that time, particularly if, if uh, it's, it's a new, new hire. So uh, I kind of alluded to uh, restricted positions um, and notice there's an asterisk there that'll be made a little bit more clear. Airline pilots, air traffic controllers, commercial driver's licenses, uh, being a truck driver, bus driver, or train engineer, or uh, uh, being in the United States military. Those are kind of some of the main ones. But remember that asterisk uh, at the beginning because there are exceptions to these, believe it or not. So if you're an air traffic controller, uh, if you're uh, controlling uh, the flight paths, landing patterns, taking off patterns of planes, qualified applicants cannot have any medical history of a, or clinical diagnosis of a convulsive disorder. Um, that is from the FAA um, and does make sense. Uh, now a history of a single provoked seizure can be accept an exception to that. Let's say you had uh, a single seizure uh, maybe in the setting of, of alcohol withdrawal uh, a decade and a half ago, um, there can be an exception made in that circumstance. Um, and then a history of an unprovoked seizure um, can undergo a medical review, uh, but that's again, if it's a single seizure. And uh, note that the uh, stipulation does uh, describe convulsive uh, disorders. So if you have non-convulsive disorders and you're uh, controlled on anti-epileptic drugs, uh, the FAA will actually look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, on the other end of the, the sky, uh, if you're talking about uh, being a commercial airline pilot, epilepsy is a disqualifying medical condition. It's actually one of 15 uh, diagnoses that are, uh, that are uh, banned. The reason for this is all of those 15 uh, can pose some degree of incapacitation uh, and an unpredictability of flare-ups or occurrences, and those are simply things, uh, at least as far as epilepsy is concerned, are incompatible in both respects uh, and unacceptable safety risks, whether they're generalized or focal uh, with preserved awareness or if you lose awareness, uh, it is a disqualifying uh, position. Now, the permanent uh, disqualification uh, from flying duties would also need to be reported to the Civil Air uh, Aerospace Medical Institute uh, if you carry that diagnosis of epilepsy. But, but again, uh, there are asterisks uh, with, uh, with these, uh, these jobs. Uh, the asterisk here is while you can't be an airline pilot, um, there are uh, special issuances um, particularly of a third class airman medical certificate where you could uh, become a uh, private uh, pilot uh, for a uh, small plane, be a recreational pilot certificate, uh, and get even solo privileges as a student pilot. Now those uh, regulations are certainly a bit higher uh, than uh, full-fledged pilots, uh, but it is uh, an exception. Um, now, with that, you must, uh, in order to even be eligible, you must remain seizure-free for 10 years and off medication for a minimum of uh, three years uh, within that time. Um, but if you are on any kind of, uh, kind of medication, that will still disqualify you. It doesn't matter how long you've been seizure-free, you have to be off the medications. The anti-epileptic medications themselves, uh, the side effects that they pose are really incompatible with flying, and that makes sense. Uh, if you, again, get a little drowsy, or uh, maybe have, have a, a tremor or something that, that limits you or could affect uh, your uh, flight pattern. Um, even that small plane can be very dangerous, obviously, for you and the people on the ground should something happen. Uh, so they do say uh, no to that. Now driving with epilepsy, that is a pretty familiar topic. Uh, about 0.01 to 0.1% of all accidents, about one in 1,000 to 10,000 accidents, uh, have been found to be caused by epilepsy. Um, and when we look at fatal uh, accidents, uh, about 0.2% uh, of uh, all motor vehicle fatalities are caused by, by epilepsy. Now the re relative risk of crashes uh, range from equally likely to twice as likely as the general population. So it, it is something that, uh, that does affect us. Now, 
Uh, that is in context because alcohol use, fatal crashes, are about eight times more likely uh, than the fatalities caused by seizures. So everything in perspective. And then if we separately look at commercial truck drivers, these are not uh, you know, in, the, in the realm of epilepsy, but just the job itself. Uh, for a normal commercial truck driving uh, employee of all the occupations in the US, truckers experience the third highest fatality rate. It is an extremely dangerous job, accounting for 12% of all worker deaths. 60% uh, of trucker fatalities do occur on the highway, um, where they often spend a lot of time. Uh, so already a very dangerous job. And then uh, when we think of epilepsy in that setting, a history of epilepsy precludes individuals from obtaining unconditional certification. And I uh, have that word in italics for a reason, uh, to drive a commercial motor vehicle uh, for interstate commerce. And that is uh, per Title 49 of the Department of Transportation's codes. Um, they interpret this to, uh, to mean a permanent disqualification of anyone with a history of epilepsy regardless of whether or not their seizures are controlled. However, this should not be an unconditional uh, exclusion of all individuals uh, from driving with a commercial uh, motor vehicle. Uh, and conditional certification may be possible in some cases. So even though uh, that word uh, unconditional is, uh, comes within the title code, there are exceptions. Um, as far as a commercial driver's license, the U.S. Department of Transportation does allow people with a history of epilepsy who have been seizure-free and off medication for 10 years uh, to be considered uh, for a commercial motor vehicle license. Now, if you have a single unprovoked seizure, drivers who have had one of those, um, by definition, do not have epilepsy. And uh, as long as they're seizure-free and off medications uh, for five years, um, they can be considered. And an earlier return to work, even in the five years, can even be considered for drivers with a normal EEG who have no epileptiform activity uh, and nor uh, normal examination by uh, their neurologist or epileptologist. Now, uh, the Department of Regulations uh, does uh, apply these rules to truckers, mostly to truckers who cross state lines, uh, those who transport goods interstate, uh, those driving vehicles over 13 tons, hauling hazardous materials, or carrying more than 15 passengers uh, in the realm of, uh, let's say, a commercial bus driver. Even still, with that, a 2014 medical expert panel for uh, commercial motor vehicles um, hired by the Department of Transportation came up with some different rules. Um, they stated that individuals with epilepsy could contain, uh, obtain uh, conditional CMB certification if the seizures were controlled for a minimum of eight years, whether they're on or off seizure medications, and if they're off meds, again, they have to be uh, seizure-free for eight years from the time that they stopped medication. If they are still on meds, they have to be seizure-free for eight years and be on the same regimen for two years, so no no switching up medications uh, due to side effects or any other reason, try and get better control, it has to be the same medication regimen uh, for two years. Um, if granted that conditional uh, basis, they must be recertified annually uh, for their, their license. But even with that said, um, I have not seen anywhere that those recommendations from that panel have been adopted anywhere, um, but something that, that certainly may be uh, considered in the future. Uh, this is something that get, gets looked at uh, at least once or twice a decade. Um, example, uh, exemption renewals in practice, uh, a lot of uh, legalese to basically say that, uh, again, you need to be seizure free. Um, your doctor needs to attest to that um, and you need to go undergo the, <coughs> the annual certification. And if anything changes from that, uh, that would be cause uh, for losing that certification. Why do they consider uh, seizure free periods of that time? Uh, well, there have been studies, uh, as uh, with this one, that have shown that if you're seizure-free uh, for a certain period of time after stopping your medications, uh, the risk of a breakthrough seizure goes from 14% four, uh, uh, within the first year down to uh, 2% at eight years, and even further down at 10 years to 1%. Now, that is over the course of a year. So you think about how many hours are in the year, turns out, uh, if you have a typical nine to five job uh, working uh, eight hours a day, uh, 
that ends up being about one fourth of uh, the time for the entire year. And as far as the study is concerned, that cuts that 2% rate down to a half of a percentage or 0.25%, uh, which is approaching uh, the seizure risk uh, of the, of the uh, well-controlled epilepsy population uh, that we use uh, to think about even personal driving. Uh, there is still a 2% risk of breakthrough, uh, but that risk is considered to be fairly low, um, particularly when uh, you consider it in the context of how many hours in the year that we drive. Um, that is why there is that exception. And finally, uh, for the military, the military is exempt from the mandates of the ADA. And the reason being is uh, by, their, uh, by their setup, they need their employees to be available for worldwide service at any time and with few limitations. Now, again, there are exceptions. If you have seizures as uh, an infant or toddler, uh, as long as you've been seizure free for five years, uh, since the age of five years old, you can be considered provided that you are off all medications. Uh, so that's uh, the US military. Thinking about other professions, uh, being part of the FBI, Border Patrol, US Post, uh, being a nurse or a doctor, even a phlebotomist, uh, police or a firefighter, um, that's where the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 comes in. And basically what that's saying uh, is it uh, reiterates the mandates of the ADA, um, explicitly prohibiting uh, discrimination uh, whether you have 15 employers or less, uh, it counts. Uh, and it stipulates uh, that there should be uh, individuals in the workforce uh, with disabilities, uh, and ideally 12% of the workforce would fit that, uh, that category, uh, and then 2% uh, of the workforce uh, with a targeted disability. So in this consideration, uh, for those jobs, 2% uh, um, could have epilepsy uh, from a quota standpoint, um, and uh, should be uh, a target for uh, looking at their employment stats. So uh, certainly accommodations may need to be made with some of these uh, professions, uh, but they are not banned, they are not restricted. Uh, so finally, uh, just a minute uh, to talk about the resources um, that, uh, that are available. So vocational rehabilitation, let's say uh, you got to your job and then all of a sudden you developed a seizure disorder, state and federal programs can help uh, uh, people with those disabilities overcome their job bar uh, barriers with therapeutic counseling, guidance to match abilities uh, with potential switches and positions, re-education and job skill training uh, to try and ensure if you do need a change of career um, that you are able to do so and also train you to have job readiness and assist with the search, uh, the job search and placement. And uh, of the studies that have been done, almost half of the people who received uh, services uh, to this degree are able to get not only employment, but competitive employment. And those are the ones who have been more likely uh, to get help with job placement and uh, job support and maintenance. Now your doctor plays a role into this too. The role of the neurologist or the epileptologist should be to counsel patients about work issues in light of the type and frequency of their seizures. So certainly, uh, we in the medical uh, profession would advise um, that you avoid uh, uh, jobs that strictly are, are uh, uh, having to do with driving um, or working in high or precarious places um, <clears throat> or those that, uh, that evolve around dangerous machinery. Certainly, uh, if you're looking for jobs out there, uh, it would be wise to avoid things that, that could uh, uh, control the risk. Again, that's something that would necessarily be banned, uh, but in thinking about what is uh, best for you, uh, your colleagues, your safety, um, we as doctors do want to make sure uh, that we're caring for you in every aspect of life. But with that said, we should be encouraging and facilitating uh, your pursuits of happiness and fulfillment. Uh, and as from the beginning, uh, work does play into that and we should 100% uh, make sure uh, that that is something uh, that we help break down the barriers to. Something that I tell all of my patients uh, is that my goal as an epileptologist is to try and make you forget that you have seizures other than the fact that you, you take your medication. And what I mean by that is I want uh, my patients to live uh, their fullest life, their happiest life, um, and not have uh, their seizures be something that interferes with any of that. That is the goal. Um, obviously, sometimes uh, there's some difficulty in achieving that, um, but we should always be working towards that benchmark. Uh, 
Uh, and lastly, uh, the Epilepsy Foundation uh, does have a very nice page uh, about epilepsy employment. Uh, this particular page I'm showing uh, gives advice about disclosing epilepsy with a potential employer. Uh, but as you can see, there are many other um, uh, subcategories and topics that they offer further uh, information on, uh, should you want to look up further. 